The second part of this unit is a file management. We're going to cover the second part of this file management unit. Again, our objective is what's in a name. We're going to discuss and learn the file naming rules, discuss and learn file naming limitations, discuss file extension and understand how the extensions identify the, ty the type, and explore the file properties and how they use, they're used to sort and search for files. There are two types of files on every computer. There are the ones that the computer uses to function. So when you get your computer or you start up your computer, there are some files in there that the computer must have. They are your programs. It may be like iTunes. It may be uh, Internet Explorer. It might be Safari. It might be Microsoft Word. There's also the operating system, and the operating system basically, without an operating system, your computer would not start up. And so it tells the computer everything what to do from startup to how to hook to the, the mouse and the keyboard and so forth. The second type of file that's on every computer are the ones that are created by you, you being the user. You might have music, documents, photos, or videos. Those types of things are the, are the files that are created by you and they're a little bit different than the ones that are right there when you open up your computer. A file name, every file has a file name that consists of two things, a name and an extension. You can see right here, your file name goes from this area until the dot. After that, it is the extension of the name and you've seen these when you've gone to save all of your documents into your folders. The file name is useful to the user and it describes the contents of the file. So every time you make something, you should name it appropriately so that it's easy for you to find rather than keeping a Word document as doc, document one, document two, and so forth. You need to give it a name. Then every, Every file name, or early file name, sorry about that, early file names were limited to eight characters with a three-letter extension. So back years ago, 15, 20 years ago, when they first started, you were limited to just eight characters, no special characters, such as your um, asterisk or your dollar sign or stuff like that. Today, File names can be up to 255 characters, including the extension. And this 255 characters are if you are going to name it using a Mac, an Apple computer. If you use the Windows version, you can go up to 260. But that would be a pretty long extension or file name. The name can include spaces and special characters, all except the colon. The colon is reserved for, especially in your Windows machines, to set up different drives that you can save to and use. File extensions, the second part of the name is the file extension. The extension is assi assigned by the program that's used to create the file. It also helps the operating system determine the type of file so that, it is be, that you can actually open it using the correct application software. If you change the extension, you may no longer be able to open it. Sometimes you can, but the majority of the times you cannot. Here's a list of a bunch of extensions. The one you're probably familiar with is this top one. The DOCX is a Word document Anytime you use Microsoft Word, it'll save it as that. Really old versions of Microsoft Word just had .doc behind it. Um, you also have a rich text format. RTF can be opened by a lot of different computers. And you can see it's either open in Word or WordPad. Or if you're um, in OS 10, it'll go to text edit. You also have Pages. I don't know how many of you still use Pages, but it's a Pages document. 
that will not open up in Windows. It is an Apple product, so it will only open up in Pages on your OS X. Then you have XLSX is for your Excel workbook. Again, older versions of that was just XLS. The new, the new version added the X to the end of the extension. PowerPoint PPPTX is, again, you can open it with PowerPoint with either the Windows machine or the OS X. BMP is for bitmap images, and if you open it in Windows, it'll open up in Paint. If you open it in, um, on, a, on a Mac, you'll open up the preview window. The same goes for your JPEG, JPEG, or JPG, basically the same thing. It opens up images. If you're on a Windows machine, it'll go right to Photos. If it goes to OS X, your default program will be the preview. MP3, .mp3 is your moving picture. So that has to be some media type. So Windows has a media player. In OS X, it'll be iTunes. AAC, which is your advanced audio coding, that'll be opened up in iTunes for both. You will see .mov, that's real familiar. Again, that's a, a video quick time movie. And again, that'll be opened up in either platforms. WMV, if you get that, that is a Windows media player. And again, you can open only open that up in your Windows machine. So if you brought a .wmv file into your Mac, you wouldn't be able to open it up. And then your PDF um, is very common also. In your Windows, it'll open up in Adobe Acrobat Reader and in your OS X, again, you could open it up in Acrobat, Adobe Acrobat Reader also, but it the default setting is for your preview. So those are just some common extensions, and you can see how by using some of them, you can open up in different platforms or the same one. File properties, each file includes file properties, which provide information about the file. You can use these properties to organize, sort, and find files real easy. Some file properties includes like the type, the size, the date, and those are automatically created along with the file. You may have some times that you can send pictures by email or whatever, and it says you can only have it a certain size. The file properties works really well to see if you are within those boundaries. To view and modify the file properties in OS X, what you have to do is in the file, in the finder, you're going to select the file. Then you go file and get info, and it'll give you all the information there. File names and other properties provide you with more information about files, and it makes them more useful and easier to manage and locate. Objective three, back it up. We're going to discuss the importance of backing up files. We're going to also discuss backup storage options, discuss the pros and cons of backup storage types, discuss backup storage software options, discuss online backup storage options. It's something many people don't think about until it's too late, losing files on a computer system that wasn't backed up. One simple step to take is to periodically back up or copy your files onto another drive, a DVD, or a flash drive. Of course, this requires you to remember to do it. We're going to take a look at how easy it is to automatically back up your files for protect protection. Backup for Windows. On the Windows machine, there is a utility that is called File History. In order to use file history, you must have an external hard drive. So you'd hook your hard drive up and then you use it. It takes you step by step through what file history is. Backup for your OS X, which is your Apple computers. You use the utility called Time Machine. And again, with Time Machine, you must have an external hard drive. The OS X, it includes the backup utility again called Time Machine. 
You can open Time Machine from the launch patch pad to configure it. Alternatively, alternatively, you can connect a new disk such as an external hard drive to your Mac and Time Machine will ask you if you want to use the disk to back up your files. Time Machine keeps three types of backups. Hourly backups for the previous 24 hours, daily backups for the past month, and weekly backups for all previous months. The oldest backups are deleted as the file fills up or as the disk fills up. Time Machine backs up everything on your computer, your personal files, as well as your system files, applications, and your settings. Other backup software, you can also use software on the external hard drive. Sometimes you buy an external hard drive and write on that drive. It has software for you, such as like Seagate Manager, WD Smartware. So again, external hard drives are an inexpensive place to back up your files. And again, they often include a backup program that you can use with one touch and it'll back up your, your information for you. You can purchase large capacity external hard drives for less than $100. Backing up to the cloud, and you should be familiar with that, we've been doing it with our iPads. Using the internet or cloud as a backup option is called backing up to the cloud. Many sites offer free personal storage of one gig or two gigabytes of information. And we're gonna cover the, the sizes after a little bit here. Or you might have unlimited storage for monthly or annual fee. So again, you can, you can purchase more to back up. Advantages, you can keep your backups at another location. This really helps if you would have a fire in your house or other types of catastrophe or somebody steals your, your device. Backups are automatic and accessible from any computer on the internet. Cloud storage allows you to store working files in a convenient place. It also serves as backup. Cloud storage is generally more limited than backup in what you can and how much you can store. So it's a little bit different than using the cloud for backup rather than just storage. OneDrive is available when you sign up free for Microsoft Office account. It gives you seven gigabytes of free online storage and you can store a lot there. Once you start putting video in there, that's when it cuts down on your storage a lot, but you can store a lot of data for seven gigabytes. You can save directly to OneDrive from Microsoft Office applications and you've probably done it in the last couple years with your iPads. Other option, you've probably heard of like Dropbox, Google Drive, A Drive, Box, Mediafire, Amazon Cloud. There's also what's called iCloud storage, Apple OS X and your iOS devices, such as your iPads and your phones, include a free online storage and sync service called iCloud. All of your devices then that since they have the iOS software or the OS X software, all of those devices can be synced to one place, the iCloud. And with that, you get five gigabytes of free storage. This table here shows you a little example of the pros and cons of comparing your backup types. You can see the first one is your internal hard drive. That's the computer itself. The price per gigabyte is relatively low. Speed is fast. It is secure inside the system unit. And again, the cons is you, you need to open the system unit to install an internal hard drive. So if you're going to add more memory to your computer, you have to open up the whole system and add it to it. It, uh, because it's in the same physical location as the orig original file, if your original files get destroyed, so will your backup. So it's not real safe from the elements. An external hard drive, on the other hand, the price is pretty low, uh, speed is fast, and it's easy to move around and secure, to put it in a secure location. Some people will 
use it as a backup and external and then put it in a safe place and then make sure that they bring out that external hard drive every once in a while and back it up. Again, you have to have the hard drive there. And if it's in the same spot as your computer or your device, then both devices, if a flood would happen or a fire, they'd both be damaged. Your optical drives, not many people use those anymore, but it's again, it's a very inexpensive way to back your stuff up on CDs or DVDs. The network you might have, for example, our school could have a network and we all save the stuff within the network that would stay within our own system. It works pretty well, but sometimes it just takes a while for it to be backed up. The bottom two are probably ones you're gonna be using most often, cloud backup. Files are stored offsite, offsite so they're protected from fire, flood, and other damages. They're accessible from other devices and locations. So again, you forget your iPad at home, you can use your phone. Um, your, a con could be that subscriptions can be expensive. It also, when you save to the cloud, you have to have an active internet connection. And sometimes, you know, that's not too tough either nowadays when we have, when we can use our phones as hotspots and so forth. Restoring files can be time consuming when used the backup. Cloud storage, again, files are off site, so they're protected from fire or floods. They're accessible from any device, just like our backup. And the difference with your storage is the capacity and the types of files may be limited. Objective four overview is shrink it. We're gonna define what file compression and its advantages are and discuss the different types of file compression. Some files used today are very large and especially they are the, the media files such as your photos, your music, and your videos. File compression then is the process of making files smaller. And the reason why you might want to make some files smaller is so that you can conserve your disk space and make the files easier to transfer. Some of the large photos or videos you cannot transfer through email, so you have to compress them or make them smaller, the file size smaller. There are different types of file compression. The first one is lossy and it's usually for image, photos, videos, and multimedia files. Substantial amount of data can be discarded before the results is sufficiently degraded to be noticed. So a lot of the, the lossy stuff can be taken out and the normal person, their eyes, they won't see it anyway. The loss list then is for files that contain text and numbers. It takes advantage of redundant information. So it'll go through there, take out the redundant stuff, and then compress it that way. Files can be decompressed with no loss of data. And files that contain text and numbers are very small compared to an image, a photo, video, and so forth. Working with compression, if you're working with a Windows machine, they use the zip format. Um, you create a zip file, you send it, and you open it up. It's really easy to do. You go to your, sh you pick your file, you, you choose share, you choose zip, and it condenses it for you. When you work with um, a Mac, it's just as easy. You'll open your finder window you make a folder for the file or files, so you can put a number of them in one file folder. Then you're going to select that folder, click file at the top, use the drop down menu, and it'll say compress. A zip file will be created in the same directory as the original folder. And then you will send that zip file and they will be able to open it from there. I will be given examples in class. Objective five then is it's always the last place you look. We're gonna take a look at how to use the search options and define Boolean operators and how they can be used to create search files. Okay, the most powerful search tool in OS 10 is called Spotlight. Okay, so when you're using a Mac, you'll use Spotlight 
and you'll click on the magnifying glass in the upper right side of your screen. It'll search for applications, contacts, other objects, files, folders, and so forth. You can also type in information like a definition, figure out a definition of a word, and it does simple math calculations. And again, I'll give examples in class. Boolean logic, then Boolean operators, they define the relationship among words or groups of words. So when you're searching for something and you use the and, um, the result must be in both. So you can see up here, if you search for John and Kennedy, just anything that shows up with the words John and Kennedy will show up in your search. If you use the word or, then the result can be either, so it would be all of them. If you use the word not, it must include the first word, but not the second. Objective six. That's not the program I wanted to open this file type. We're gonna define a default program and discuss how default programs are associated with certain programs. Learn how to change or set the default program associated with the file type. Your operating system maintains a list of file extensions and associated default programs that enables it to automatically open the correct program when you click on a file. This is fine for file types that are specific to one program, such as DOCX for Microsoft Word and .mov for QuickTime, but it can be a problem with more generic file types that can be opened with several different programs. For example, take the file extensions .mp3. By default, Windows associates MP3s files with Window Media Player. But if you install another program that can play music files such as Apple iTunes, the association may be changed. We're going to take a look at how to manage default programs and type files associated in OS X. To change the default program in OS X, you're going to open your finder and select the file, File, Get Information, where we've been before. You're going to click the Open With and choose the proper application from the list. And then you will click Change All 